Okay. Um, how's everybody doing today? I want to uh, I want to uh, let everybody um, welcome you. It's a great afternoon, and um, I welcome you to the part of Sport and Entertainment Management. Um, this will be a great afternoon to talk about the sport and entertainment business. Uh, today is is a first for our lecture series. Uh, our former student, he also took 440, is, is our moderator for the day. And if, this is a transitional time in the sports business. Global sports venues and events are kind of in a holding pattern to an extent. Pro sports is limited by attendance. Will the SEC be at full capacity in the fall for SEC football? But we might be able to add a few insights into this in the pro sports space <coughs> in the next conversation. The purpose is the executive lecture series is to bring sport and entertainment executives to the USC community and to enhance the student experience. Our mission is to teach and assist you in your careers. This afternoon, please listen and learn. You never know who or what can create a passion in your life and to assist you in your career. You have to enjoy your career, find that passion and work hard to attain those goals. Now, when we, um, talk about this department and why we started this lecture series. It, it was funded by NASCAR. NASCAR endowed this lecture series and I always have to thank them for the opportunity they provided in order to have this platform for our industry lecture series. Now I'd like to introduce Sydney Pedro. She is a senior in the department and happens to be a fantastic representative of sport and entertainment. She comes from Clarksburg, New Jersey. I believe that's exit eight. And she started in the fall of 2018. She comes from a great family, really worked. She recently worked on the Masters in Augusta, and she has a new good friend, Peyton Manning. She is president of the USC Club Field Hockey Team, a member of Sigma Psi Mu, the SBT fraternity. And now I'd like to introduce her, and, and she will introduce our moderator and speaker. Sydney, take it away. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Regan. So the first person I'm honored to introduce today is Dr. Josh, uh, sorry, Mr. Josh Rosen, the Senior Director of Corporate Communications at Hornet Sports and Entertainment. Mr. Rosen is in his 14th season with the organization and his second as Senior Director of Corporate Communications. Mr. Rosen, who joined the franchise as Basketball Communications Manager in August of 2007, oversees the public relations efforts around Hornet Sports Entertainment's business units, including the Spectrum Center and corporate social responsibility initiatives. He also serves as Hornet Sports and Entertainment's chief copywriter and editor, working with departments throughout the organization on messaging and communications to various constituents. He's also responsible for alumni relations with former players. Prior to joining the franchise, Mr. Rosen spent more than four years at Streets and Smith's Sports Business Daily, including two and a half years as assistant managing editor. His previous experience also includes one season as media relations coordinator for the Carolina Cobras of the Arena Football Sport League, and two seasons as the public relations assistant for the Charlotte Sting of the WBA. He's a native of Charlotte, um, and he graduated from the University of South Carolina in 2002 where he majored in sport and entertainment management and spent three seasons as a student manager for coach Eddie Vogler's, Vogler's men's basketball team. He and his wife, Beverly, are married in July 2015. They have two children, Madeline and, Nip, Madeline and Matthew. Um, the second person I'm honored to introduce is Mr. Fred Whitfield, who is the president and vice chairman of the Hornets Sports and Entertainment. Mr. Whitfield has served the Hornet Sports and Entertainment Organization since 2006. In his role, he oversees the day-to-day -day activities of the Spectrum Center and the Charlotte Hornets Foundation, including long-range policy procedures and revenue goals. Mr. Whitfield serves as the Hornets' primary spokesman and assures values of the corporations are upheld. Among his key accomplishments are reconstructing and transformation in the value of the Hornets franchise from less than 3 million in 2006 to a current value of greater than 1.5 billion. In response to COVID-19 pandemic, he held the mobilization of a safe return work plan, including working with the NBA and Hornets basketball operations to create a soft bubble for the team to practice in a safe environment. 
He's worked alongside North Carolina Governor Roy Cooper on the economic recovery plan for the community. He's also worked closely with Mayor Lyles, Lyles to establish community initiatives to address social justice issues and currently is a member of the MBA Global Diversity and Inclusion Council. A 1995 graduate of Campbell University with a degree in economics, he's also an accomplished varsity basketball player. Mr. Whitfield completed his MSA at his alma mater and earned his Juris Doctorate degree from North Carolina Central University School of Law. He was inducted into the North Carolina Sports Hall of Fame in 2018 and in 2019 was awarded the prestigious Citizen of Carolina Award. Mr. Whitfield and his wife, Mary, reside in Charlotte, North Carolina. Um, so now we'll start with a quick video uh, promoting Hornet Sports and Entertainment. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I want to start off by saying it, it truly is an honor for me uh, to be here today. As Sydney mentioned, uh, I did graduate from the Department of Sport and Entertainment Management in 2002. Um, Dr. Regan was my advisor uh, back when when professors did their own advising. Um, so this uh, it truly means a lot uh, to me to be here today to take part with with my boss, Fred Whitfield. Um, in this uh, in this seminar. Real quick before we start, uh, I want to explain a little bit about the backgrounds, uh, that, the background that Fred and I are using. Um, not sure how many of you are familiar with the way Nike and Jordan brand and the NBA do uniform designs, but every year we have a different uniform edition. And, and that is designed to celebrate an aspect of local pride. So this year, for the 2021 season, we did a uniform that is mint with gold and green accents, or I'm sorry, gold and granite uh, accents. The idea being to celebrate the city of Charlotte's history as home of the first US branch mint and the Carolina gold rush 
from the early 1800s. Um, so as you can see in the background, we, we have done a lot this year with mint and gold. Um, it's been a huge hit with our players and our fans. Um, we've sold through a lot of merchandise, which has been great. Um, we're actually going to wear that uniform a total of 15 times this season, including tomorrow night's game at Brooklyn. Uh, it's something that we're pretty proud of. So Fred and I decided we wanted this to, to be our background for today. Um, with that, I, I want to get started. And Fred, to, to begin, tell us briefly about the journey that brought you to where you are today. Well, first of all, Josh, um, thanks for, for being here and moderating this. And uh, I'd be remiss if I, I didn't say I had to go in my closet and pull out my garnet and black uh, sport coat today. Uh, so I'd feel right at home uh, with the Gamecocks. Uh, and also just briefly before I answer that question, Josh, would like to acknowledge my deep roots with, um, with the University of South Carolina. Uh, Charles Waddell, who's Associate Athletic Director there. Uh, now I'm dating myself, Sydney. I uh, wish I had graduated in 1995, but I actually graduated from an undergrad in 1980 from Campbell University. And uh, in the early 80s, uh, Charles Waddell and I met uh, when he was working on the staff at the University of North Carolina. And I'd ride up from Campbell University when I was in graduate school to, to watch my friend Michael Jordan play for the University of North Carolina. And Charles Waddell was on the back door with a handwritten list that had my name on it that allowed me to walk in that back door and enjoy watching Michael play as a Tar Heel. And then uh, Sporty Jurels, Professor Jurels, who, uh, uh, who I met back uh, when he worked uh, and ran the old Charlotte Coliseum, uh, is now a professor there. Uh, has been a great friend since the late 80s. Uh, and when I came here in 2006 as president of the Bobcats, I refused to let Sporty leave our organization. And to this day, uh, he still works with us in welcoming uh, our fans into our arena nightly and also working out in the community uh, with the underserved community, giving tickets out to those in need. And Professor Danny Morrison and I have been friends since he was in graduate school at Elon working on his master's degree. And I was at Campbell in graduate school in the uh, early 1980s. Uh, and again, we, he and I became friends then. Little did I know us then as assistant basketball coaches for Elon and Campbell would ultimately one day be the team presidents of the Carolina Panthers and the Charlotte Bobcats at the same time. And to this day, Danny and I remain very close and I serve on the executive committee of the Charlotte Sports Foundation where he's our executive director. And of course, Coach Don Staley and I go back to her playing days at the University of Virginia uh, as an All-American player. Uh, certainly followed her uh, professional career and watched her become an Olympian, have celebrated her success as the coach of the Gamecocks and uh, look forward to her being our women's national coach in the upcoming Olympics. And uh, last but not least, Josh uh, Rosen, who is our moderator. Uh, and one of my close confidants and colleagues uh, who I count on to help us tell our story, our Hornet story the right way uh, from a business perspective, who uh, writes uh, most of my quotes much better than I could write them, uh, writes all of our press releases and uh, finds ways to get our, our organization out in the community in the right way and tell about not only what we do as a basketball team, but the things we do to give back in our community and how we continue to grow our business. So I can't tell you how honored I am to be here with Josh because I know how much he loves the University of South Carolina. He and I have those discussions from time to time. So it's an honor to be here with him today. Uh, but just quickly on my story, I grew up in Greensboro, North Carolina and, uh, and, and had a lot of great role models to, to look up to as a kid. Uh, started right at home, both my parents, uh, uh, were college graduates. Both of my parents had master's degrees from uh, North Carolina a and um, They taught me at an early age just how important education was and how it could be a difference maker in my life and allow me to pursue uh, literally any career that I'd want to pursue if I wasn't good enough to be a professional athlete. Um, but more importantly, they encouraged me to really chase my dreams and, and feel like anything I wanted to accomplish might be possible. Uh, I was a high school athlete at uh, Southeast Guilford High School. Uh, I was president of my senior class. I was vice president of the student body and, uh, and was very lucky at an early age that even my classmates in high school uh, looked, looked to me to help lead them uh, in the student government and through our class activities. And 
I'd say that was my first opportunity to really lead. Uh, the other uh, important thing is uh, as, a, as a basketball player, um, you know, being selected to be the team captain um, was another opportunity by my high school teammates to allow me to be the leader of that team. Uh, I went on to become a college basketball player at Campbell University on a full scholarship. Uh, and I studied economics, uh, majored in economics and, um, and was able to earn my Bachelor of Business Administration, administration degree, degree at Campbell. Also, again, very, very for, fortunate and honored that my teammates selected me as team captain of my college team. Uh, as I mentioned, I went back to Campbell and, and, uh, and worked on my graduate degree, my master's in business administration, um, really focusing in marketing at that time. Earned my MBA and also served as assistant basketball coach of, of the Fighting Camels. Uh, after Phoenix in grad school, I, I went to work briefly for a year as an internal auditor with Burlington Industries, uh, at the time the largest textile company in the world. Got a chance to travel all over the world, audit in plant locations, sales offices, and the, and, the, and the like for Burlington Industries. After a year, I decided that I wanted to go back to law school because I wanted to try and find a way to get back involved in sports and represent athletes as an agent. Felt like to be uh, legitimate and be uh, qualified to be able to not just recruit and sign athletes, but to do the deals and be the person helping manage their careers. I felt like I needed to get a law degree. So I entered North Carolina uh, Central School of Law. Uh, again, very fortunate that my classmates selected me as a first year class representative. Uh, to represent our class in the Student Bar Association, which is like the student government. And now uh, my third year, I was elected by the student body to be Student Bar Association president and represent our law school and, and the students within my law school. Uh, after graduating law school, I went back to Greensboro and just hung my shingle and uh, started practicing law, but always had the goal of getting into to, to pro sports and wanted to be a sports attorney and a sports agent. Uh, I was very lucky that uh, you know, having had a friend like Michael Jordan uh, that I met when he was in high school and I was a, a young college player, uh, didn't have any idea that when uh, the large sports management firms were trying to recruit me uh, to work with them, International Management Group, the largest in the world at the time, Advantage International, which was very large, where they were recruiting me to come in and be a young attorney in their firm. I thought they wanted this young hotshot lawyer with his MBA, with an economics degree, uh, and at the end of all of those interviews, the last question was, hey, if we hire you and you jump on our team, we, can you help us steal Michael Jordan away from David Falk to represent him? And obviously that was a huge conflict for me and Michael was just my friend, not doing any business for him. And, uh, and he and I talked about it and it made a lot more sense um, when David Falk, who did actually represent Michael as his, as his sports attorney and an agent, uh, offered me the opportunity to join his firm, I did so. Uh, so I became one of the lawyers in David Falk's firm, Falk Associates Management Enterprises. Uh, while there, I represented uh, 10 uh, NFL players, uh, most of whom I brought with me uh, to that firm. But, but while at the firm, I signed two NBA draft picks, one from Clemson. I know you don't like that. Uh, Sharon Wright, who went number six in his draft. And uh, right before him in that draft was Juwan Howard, who played at the University of Michigan, who's now the head coach at the University of Michigan. I represented uh, those two young men, when they were drafted in the first round of the NBA draft, I think in 1992 was their draft. Um, stayed in that business for about five years until David sold his firm. And then I was recruited by Nike to join their organization and oversee all of our NBA activities in the Eastern Conference of the NBA, which meant I basically represent 150 NBA players, uh, negotiated all of our player contracts uh, as they came up did all of our college scouting and made uh, recommendations to Phil Knight and senior management on who we should sign to represent in each upcoming draft, and then negotiate those deals against their player agents and added those players into our Nike family. I was there about five years, and then when Michael Jordan bought into the Washington Wizards as a part owner and became president of basketball operations, he asked me to come there and join him on the basketball side as director of player personnel and in-house legal counsel primarily responsible for negotiating player contracts, managing the salary cap, overseeing our scouting, and also overseeing our training camp and other things like that. Uh, I was there three years, the three that he was there. He was there once as an executive and the last two as a player. Uh, and then he left after, after uh, retiring finally from the NBA and, uh, and left the Wizards organization. 
I remained there for another couple of months or so, and then parted ways with uh, with the Wizards. And then ultimately, a few months later, Nike asked me if I consider coming back there and joining what at the time was a very small up and coming brand within Nike called Jordan Brand. At the time, we were about a three hundred million dollar a year business. Uh, I was charged with helping put the strategy together to build that small business into a billion dollar a year entity. I was there from 2003 to 2006, and we went from 300 million a year uh, to 900 million a year at that point. And in 2006, uh, when Michael Jordan bought a small interest in the, what used to be the Charlotte Bobcats uh, and became responsible for basketball operations, Bob Johnson, who owned our team at the time, asked me if I consider coming and running the business side. And I joined the, 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 the Charlotte Bobcats in July of 2006 as president and chief operating officer. Uh, I've been here since uh, 2006. Uh, fortunately, uh, I've been promoted. And, uh, and when Michael bought our organization in 2010 uh, as our majority owner, he allowed me to invest alongside him and become a minority partner in the Charlotte Bobcats at the time. And I think we'll get into it a little more about our transition from the Bobcats to the Hornets. Uh, but it's been quite a ride here. And, uh, and uh, Dr. Regan, I, I heard you mention NASCAR. Uh, I thought now would be the appropriate time to mention how much Michael and I both love NASCAR. Having grown up on it, growing up here in North Carolina, uh, Michael, as most of you probably know, is invested in a, in a race team, uh, 2311 Racing with Denny Hamlin. And I'm also very honored that he's allowed me to invest and become a minority partner in 2311 Racing. And so, uh, so we're having a great time in the NASCAR space. And Steve Phelps, who's a President Nan has become a great friend and, uh, and someone we see at the track from time to time. Fred, Josh, you, go ahead, I'm sorry. No, you're good. Um, we talked about your journey. What has been the most challenging aspect of your journey to get where you are today? Well, I think the most challenging thing, honestly, Josh, has been um, really navigating through a lot of uh, tough times. You know, you know, you've been here with this uh, 14 years now. Um, we haven't had a lot of success on the on the basketball court. Uh, however, we've had a lot of success on the business side, uh, and I think a lot of that is because um, you know we've we've been able to work very closely with other NBA teams, with the NBA to to implement best practices, and uh, and have always thought on the business side we want to prepare our business operations team to get ready for a, a team on the floor that'll win 50 games, and then we'll be prepared to maximize every revenue opportunity. So from, you know, having a team that only won seven games out of 56 games uh, in a year was certainly a challenge for all of us. Uh, certainly having that worst record in the league that year and uh, going into the draft, hoping to be able to draft Anthony Davis and instead of getting the first pick and drafting him, uh, the lottery uh, balls gave us a second pick. Um, but what I'd say, uh, Josh, is, and, and you know this being a part of our team, we look at all these challenges as opportunities. And so um, we, we found a way to really um, make lemonade out of lemons. We found a way to stay positive. We found a way to energize our brand. We found a way to grow our season ticket base to where we have over 10,000 full season ticket holders. We have uh, right at 100 corporate sponsors that enjoy putting their brand next to our brand. Uh, so even though it's been a challenge not to necessarily have won on the floor, um, you know, what I'd say is we've been able to, you know, drive a very positive business model that I think Michael and our other uh, partners in the Hornets organization are proud of. You know, other than, you know, being here, you know, certainly there are challenges around, you know, getting additional degrees. And, and I'm a big proponent of getting as many degrees as you can. Uh, I don't think it necessarily makes you, you know, that much smarter than the next person if you get your MBA or your law degree. But I think it does add to your toolbox and it changes somehow the way you think and, and you become more of a critical thinker. And it also shows those that may want to have you join their team or their organization that you, you persevered and you fought through tough times. You passed the bar exam, which is extremely hard to do. And so I call all of those steps along the way in my journey challenges, um, but ones that I'm you know, honored and happy that I was able to work my way through because I, I certainly don't feel, me in particular, that I would have been given the opportunity to run this organization dating back to 2006 if I didn't have all the things that I happen to have in my toolbox. 
certainly uh, certainly makes sense. And it, it's funny that you mentioned getting all the all the degrees you can, and you know this, Fred. And I I feel compelled to bring it up since you, since you mentioned it. Um, you know that, that Beverly, my wife, uh, also has her MBA and her JD, and is in the process of getting a doctorate, um, and is actually uh, proposing her dissertation topic tomorrow morning. Wow! So, uh, wow. I can certainly uh, certainly am familiar with getting enough degrees. <laughs> it's a lot. <laughs> yes, indeed. Um, do you have specific people or memories from growing up? that you feel like have influenced who you are? Yeah, I do, Josh, you know, um, and, and Sydney, I wanna, again, and now I'm gonna really date myself and, uh, and let everyone know how old I am. Um, but, but I grew up in Greensboro, North Carolina. And if you don't know a lot about Greensboro, there's a lot of history associated with Greensboro, especially uh, as it relates to the civil rights movement. Um, you know, the, the, the sit-ins, uh, um, that were in, in, in Greensboro in the 60s, uh, where four North Carolina a t students uh, sat at a lunch counter and uh, refused to leave until they eventually were served. Uh, certainly has opened up our world to having all of us be able to dine together uh, in, a, in an environment where everyone feels welcome. You know, there were a lot of civil rights leaders that lived and grew up in Greensboro, and they were right there in front of my eyes that allowed me to really understand that if I got a lot of education and picked the right dreams to chase that it was a possibility I could chase some of them. You know, a couple that come to mind is uh, Elrita Alexander Ralston, who uh, grew up in Greensboro and went to Dudley High School, which was a predominantly black high school. Uh, and, and at age 15, graduated from high school, graduated from North Carolina a at 18 years of age. I uh, actually wanted to go to University of North Carolina Law School and could not go because she was black. And so instead, uh, she enrolled at Columbia University and, uh, and graduated in 1945, uh, came back to North Carolina, started practicing law, uh, ended up uh, becoming the first black woman in the United States to be elected as a judge right in Guilford County in my home county, uh, and certainly became a role model for a lot of African-American young women, but those of us that were African-American, period. And then I think of Henry Fry Sr., who attended my church, Providence Baptist Church, where a lot of the black doctors and lawyers and the president of North Carolina a t attended every Sunday, you know, to be able to, you know, go to church with Henry Fry Sr., who uh, was denied the right to, to vote because of a literacy, quote unquote, literacy test. And then watching him, you know, or knowing that he went to the University of North Carolina Law School uh, and became the first black student to enroll there went on in 1963 to become the first black U.S. attorney. In 1968, uh, became the first black member of the North Carolina General Assembly as a legislator, and then later became a member of the North Carolina Supreme Court and ultimately became the Chief Justice of the North Carolina Supreme Court. And to have that person in my church every Sunday as a role model that I could go up to, talk to, ask questions, certainly energized um, you know, my thought process that I could go to law school, become a lawyer and figure out how I wanted to navigate my career with, with the law degree. And so, you know, those two in particular, along again with my parents who, you know, having them at home every day with master's degrees and my mom being a, a first grade school teacher for 35 years and just preaching education, education, education. Those are the type of role models it took for me to be able to really believe that I could do the things that, or try to do some of the things that, you know, Henry Fry and El Rita Alexander uh, had accomplished, but just in another field. That's great. Uh, that's great stuff. Um, that's also a really good seg into a different topic um, that you and I have worked closely on over the last uh, eight or nine months now, uh, and that's diversity and inclusion. Talk to us about the importance of having a diverse and inclusive workplace and the need to recruit and retain people from all walks of life? You know, it's, it's a great question, Josh, and, and you're right. We've been focused on that a lot over the last year, but the reality is, you know, we really didn't know that we've been focused on it the whole time I've been here since 2006, because it was just authentic and a part of the core of our culture and who we were. 
Um, you know, I never really thought about it, you know, when I worked at Nike, uh, that we had just an unbelievably diverse workforce uh, with, with, with men, whether it's gender diversity, race diversity, you know, people from all over the world that were part of the Nike family and working at Nike. It was just how Phil Knight authentically grew Nike. You know, certainly because I, I believe Phil Knight is, if not the, um, certainly one of the two or three of my most admired business executives, you know, he always went out and recruited the brightest and the best, regardless of what they looked like, how they thought. He encouraged all of us to, you know, speak our minds, come to uh, meetings and, 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 and not be afraid to take a chance. And when I came here as president in 2006, I couldn't help but bring that culture that I learned at Nike into the Bobcats organization as, as president. And with that, I came with the, with the thought that in order to be the brightest and the best and have the best ideas and, and be as creative as possible, we needed people that thought differently, that were raised differently, that had different life experiences, um, that were not afraid to challenge each other and be encouraged to do so. And to me, that's exactly what diversity and inclusion is about. And I know Michael has built a very successful brand. I mentioned Jordan brand. Well, now that brand is doing four and a half billion a year in business. And, uh, and they have a very diverse workforce as a part of, of Nike. And, and Michael has embraced that from day one. And so, um, you know, we're intentional about it. Um, we're proud that we have the most diverse uh, executive team in the NBA. Uh, Michael Jordan is the only majority owner of any professional sports team in any of the four major sports leagues. Uh, certainly, he would like to see that change. We'd like to see more diversity in leadership roles. Um, we've got uh, one of the few uh, African-American chief operating officers in James Jordan, Donna Julian, who's our general manager and exec executive vice president that runs our arena, is one of the highest ranking women in all of pro sports, Marlene Hendricks is uh, a senior vice president with us and has been recognized by the NBA as being the leader in customer service. I mean, I could go on and on and on, but Josh, you know um, that over the last year, we became even more laser focused on diversity and inclusion. Uh, you have been uh, one of our leaders in helping us put together our diversity and inclusion council internally at, at the Hornets. Um, and, and one of the co-chairs, you know, certainly we do have an authentically built and based on uh, diverse and inclusive environment that we operate here, but we don't have all the answers. We're still trying to learn more. Uh, I think in my introduction, it was noted that I serve on the NBA Global Diversity and Inclusion Council, and I give tons of credit to Adam Silver and the NBA and, and, uh, and Mark Tatum, who's our deputy commissioner, for having us, as long as I can remember, be so focused on being inclusive of all. And uh, us launching our employee resource groups uh, to allow groups of people that have uh, like interest and like uh, topics they'd like to discuss uh, to be able to come together. I think it's been wonderful for our organization. And I'm so proud uh, of how we as an organization uh, try to critically think and try to really think outside the box and while maintaining a very diverse and inclusive environment. You mentioned the NBA's initiatives. As, a, as far as leagues go, I think we can all agree the NBA is generally at the forefront of sports entities when it comes to taking a stand on cultural issues, whether it's diversity and inclusion, whether it's social justice. Why do you think that is? Well, I think it all starts with our leader. Um, you know, when, when I think about, you know, the late Commissioner David Stern, who, uh, who I absolutely loved and, and who I was so honored and fortunate that he, you know, liked me and took me under his wing. You know, it all started with just the way, you know, he ran the NBA and, and became our leader and then passed the torch off to Adam Silver after Adam having worked at his dep as his deputy for 19 or so years. Uh, Adam just continued, you know, what David built. And, you know, very shortly after Adam took the helm as commissioner, he had a very tough decision to make when it came to the, the, the former owner of the Los Angeles Clippers that um, allegedly made uh, some racist remarks. Uh, Adam swiftly and decisively, uh, in conjunction with the, the other owners in the league, made it a decision they felt like they needed to make and moving in a different direction. I think that was the first time that uh, Adam had to make a tough decision 
which really, you know, made a statement about what our league would stand for going forward. Um, I, you know, what I'll say about NASCAR, uh, and I think it's very interesting because their their president Steve Phelps, who I've start I'm starting to get to know well. Uh, it's, it's so focused on diversity and inclusion there as well. And uh, and we're thrilled at 2311 to, to have Bubba Wallace as the only African-American driver uh, out um, uh, in the Cup Series now. Um, but Steve Phelps has made some really tough decisions as well relative to the, the, the Confederate flag and not allowing that to be uh, hung at racetracks anymore. Uh, certainly was a statement on behalf of NASCAR and, uh, and, and I think, you know, we want all of our sports, we want the whole world to, to feel like, hey, we, we all should be in this thing together. We should all be friends together. We should all work together. It shouldn't matter, you know, what any of us look like, you know, what our, our ethnicity is, what our gender is, what our, our sexual orientation might be, uh, or anything like that. It should really be an open, inclusive environment. And I think sports brings people together. Uh, I think sports uh, allows people to communicate both on and off the court. Uh, in general, I think sports lead uh, cultures and have people uh, following athletes, young 19-year-olds. Uh, uh, many people around the world follow young 19-year-olds, and they're creating what our culture looks like. And I think what we found is that athletes want their voices heard. They don't want to just play uh, on the football field, or on the basketball court, or on the tennis court, on the on the on the golf course, they want their voices heard, and 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 I think our league is one of the leaders in that. Uh, when I think back on the bubble in Orlando this summer, and the NBA embracing uh, not only the NBA but the WNBA as well, embracing Black Lives Matter, um, the phrases of unity uh, on the back of jerseys, the kneeling, and allowing our players to you know, be able to come together and kneel during the national anthem if they like. And if not, they certainly weren't pushed to. Uh, the Milwaukee Bucks boycotting the playoff game after the, the Jacob Blake shooting, the launching of our NBA foundation, which uh, all 30 of our teams have agreed that we're going to invest a million dollars a year um, for the next 10 years, $300 million towards uh, social injustice, systemic racism, I'm so proud and honored that uh, an organization here in Charlotte, Road to Hire, um, which, which is a phenomenal organization here, was just awarded a $500,000 grant by the NBA Foundation uh, last week. And, uh, and, and we played a major part in helping them submit their grant. And even when it comes to voting, uh, you know, us, you know, and, and other NBA teams really embracing you know, the voting initiative, how important it is for people to exercise their right to vote. We were one of the NBA teams that took our arena, the Spectrum Center, and turned it into an early voting site for 16 days. We weren't telling anyone how to vote, uh, who they should vote for, but help people learn how to register the vote. If they had any impediments uh, to getting to the polling place, we'd help them get transportation and then create a seamless, safe environment, even during the pandemic to come in and exercise that right to vote. And then of course, when I think about Michael Jordan personally, uh, just you know, the donation of commitment that he and Jordan Brandon made to donate a hundred million dollars over the next 10 years to impact and fight against any kind of systemic racism, any kind of social injustice, economic uh, disparity, any education or awareness uh, disparity, that hundred million will go towards that. and uh, and. I'm proud that, that our owner has made that statement and that our league stands for what it stands for because it really is about unity and bringing our country together as a whole. You mentioned our owner, our chairman, Michael Jordan. Obviously as an organization, we follow his lead. What is it like to work with him and what motivates him to enhance the community, both in Charlotte, North Carolina, and the Carolinas at large? Well, well you know, Josh, it, it, it's an honor for me to work with him because as I mentioned before, he and I date back and became friends when he was in high school and I was a college player at Campbell University. So we've been, a, we've been friends, you know, almost 40 years. And so, you know, to have had the opportunity to work alongside him and, uh, and work with him to to help him build his career as a player and off the court to help uh, him build the Jordan brand to work with him in Washington at the Wizards, 
um, to watch him unceremoniously have to leave the Wizards and me do the same right alongside him certainly was a learning experience and a tough time for us. Um, but nothing's been more gratifying than us being able to come back to our home state and him be able to come become the majority owner of our franchise and and me be, be allowed to be or uh, able to be a partner and invest alongside of him. But Michael's all about community. He's all about doing what he can to help others. I mentioned the $100 million uh, donation that he and Jordan Brand are making. Um, but the day he bought our team, he made a commitment back in 2010 that we as an organization would be heavily involved in the Charlotte community and region and give back to those in need. He challenged us as an organization to find four or five pillars that we could dive deep into and help the underserved. One was education. We always thought, or he always thought, there was a disparity in education uh, within the Charlotte community, and it's true. And so we've been involved from 2010 in working with CMS, Charlotte Mecklenburg Schools, and trying to help them with their educational programs. There's a huge hunger issue in, in Charlotte, and we've chosen to partner with Food Line and dive deep and try and help those uh, food deserts here in, in Charlotte be able to uh, get food through Second Harvest Food Bank and others uh, and be heavily involved in that. Uh, also, wellness, fitness and wellness, and uh, you know, a lot of obesity, a, little, a lot of childhood obesity, a lot of medical issues that particularly the underserved and the, the underprivileged have gone through. And so we partnered with Novant Health, our partner there, to really address a lot of those needs. And then clearly the military is something that's very important to our organization. Michael's brother, uh, James Jordan, as I mentioned, is our chief operating officer. He's a 31-year military veteran. And uh, certainly uh, celebrated and decorated uh, military uh, officer. And so to have him as part of our organization there, we've been so focused on how we could help uh, those on the front line that are putting their lives on, 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 on um, putting their lives on the line every day to fight for our country. And so whether it's welcoming veterans back and helping them get integrated back in the, in the community, we've been involved in that. And so, you know, the other things that we've been focused on are the, the social justice platforms. We are about to announce our Innovation Summit uh, winner uh, of minority companies within a 45 mile radius of Charlotte that are entrepreneurs trying to help them get their businesses going. Um, we've done some things around Martin Luther King Day, uh, been focused on economic mobility and how we can try and help make sure that young kids learn how to read by the time they're in the third grade, so they'll have a chance to be able to go out and, um, and, and be able to have a decent career. And I mentioned the voting piece, and the voting piece is, is certainly very important. But I'd say of all these areas, Josh, probably economic mobility is one that has really come to the forefront. A Harvard study back in 2014 uh, alarmed all of us in Charlotte that Charlotte was 50 out of 50 among America's largest cities for economic mobility. And basically what that means is a child that's born into poverty in Charlotte has a greater chance of being impoverished their entire lives than any other major city in the country, which is not something we're proud of in Charlotte. So we've worked our tails off with the other corporate uh, leaders in the community, with our mayor, Mayor Lyles, with our city manager, Marcus Jones, with our city council to do everything that we can to try and make sure that we address this economic mobility issue. I'd say road to hire, as I mentioned before, is one of those great pathways where we've got 14 and 15 companies that are bringing young people in that may not necessarily want to go to college, but teaching them how to code and how to do other great um, 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 work environments and, and jobs that will allow them to earn you know, really good living. And so it's a community effort. And I'd say we as an organization have tried to take the lead. And again, as you mentioned, Josh, we're following Michael's lead on this. Absolutely. Uh, let's change gears for a minute and talk about leadership. Fred, how would you describe your leadership style? Um, you know, I try to emulate Phil Knight. Um, I'm probably not doing a very good job because he's one of the best, but um, what I've always tried to do is, is try to sur surround myself with a very, very talented group of, of executives that help me lead. Uh, so, you know, I try to find, 
you know, leaders to, to make have a part of my senior leadership team that are smarter than I am, that, are, that know more about a subject matter than I do, uh, that I can listen to, that I can lean on, that I can trust their advice. I'd say probably 95% of the time, you know, I'm listening to my department heads on uh, how they think the direction of the organization may go. Um, I, I'm hoping that we've recruited the brightest and the best in every area of our company, regardless of what they look like or how they think. Um, my, my position is once you hire the brightest and the best, you got to let them do their jobs. You can't micromanage them. You can't tell them who to hire. You can't tell them who they need to part ways with. You can't tell them how to put their strategy together necessarily. Stay involved, stay engaged. And like I mentioned, 95% of the time, I agree with them. The 5% of the time that we disagree, uh, certainly I have to make the final decision, but I like that decision being a joint decision that we've collaborated on, we've talked through, we've, you know, they'll get their opportunity to prove me wrong. You know, I'll get my opportunity to make my case and then hopefully we'll make a joint decision that we're making the right decision that's in the best interest of the organization. But I do think that it is critically important as a leader to not be intimidated to hire really bright, brilliant people to be on your team, to trust them, to allow them to lead, to allow them to recruit their teammates and make sure at the end of the day that you all stay connected and have one goal in mind, which is the goal should be whatever's in the best interest of the organization. I know the answer to this question, but I'm gonna go ahead and ask it anyway. And, and I think anybody who's been paying attention so far today, it, We'll, we'll have an idea of who you're gonna say. Um, share with us a person or two, because uh, I don't think you can choose just one, who has had a significant impact on you as a leader and, and why. Well, I, honestly, I, I, I think it is, it, it is two, Josh. Um, and and I, I'm not even gonna put Michael in that too. Clearly, you know, he's had a huge impact on me and and the way I think and the way I manage, because, you know, I try to manage his slash our organization the way he would. But I've talked a lot about Phil Knight. Um, you know, it's very clear that he's had an amazing impact on my life, life. And I'm so grateful for the opportunity to have had to work alongside of him for two terms, you know, one time five years, one time three years. I think, you know, he's built a culture where Success breeds success. He breeds a culture of hiring the brightest and the best, as I mentioned. Um, and, uh, and I've tried to follow that in my leadership style. And then I'd have to say Adam Silver. Um, again, so fortunate that Adam has embraced me, uh, has given me the opportunity to serve on literally five of them, every subcommittee at the NBA that a business operations president serves on. Adam's given me that opportunity to serve on all five and be, you know, one of his advisors and leaders. But not only that, he's taught me so much about leadership, about partnership, about collaboration, about teamwork, about how to make tough decisions and hit them head on. When I think about the Don Ster Donald Sterling situation that I mentioned earlier with the Clippers, what a tough decision you have to, had to make, or he had to make three months into his tenure as commissioner to, to really force an owner to sell his team. And then as I think about you know him, Adam Silver, pulling the 2017 NBA All-Star game from Charlotte because of House Bill 2, uh, which most of you may remember was the old bathroom bill we had here in North Carolina. It was the right thing to do for all the right reasons, but after Charlotte and we at the Hornets had worked for almost two years to recruit that game here, you know, Adam had to make that tough decision and make a phone call to me and say, hey, Fred, I'm sorry. We got to move the All-Star game out of North Carolina as long as House Bill 2 is on the books because any form of discrimination goes against all the principles that we represent at the NBA. And then he said, but Fred, if you will work alongside me and we can spend time with the governor of North Carolina and the legislature in North Carolina, we will do all we can to help North Carolina understand how House Bill 2 is harming and hurting people for no right reason. If you'll work with me, I'll support you and your organization, and we'll bring the next available All-Star game back to Charlotte once House Bill 2 is repealed. 
took a lot of courage from Adam to be the first person to make a decision to pull a major event out of the state of North Carolina in 2016, but he did it. I gained so much, even more respect for Adam because everything he said he'd do along the way, he did, including work alongside uh, me and other business leaders to work with Governor Cooper and, uh, and Senator Berger and Speaker Moore and, and Senator Blue on the Democratic side in North Carolina and, uh, and, the, and the House Minority Leader, Darren Jackson. You know, the five of the governor and those four key leaders on both sides of the aisle working closely with Adam and a, a bunch of us, business, not a bunch, six of us business leaders and having House Bill 2 uh, repealed. So those are my two that, uh, you know, have really impacted the way I think, impacted the way I try to lead, the two I try to emulate every day when I come to the office, and, uh, and two that I'm just so honored, proud, and, uh, and thrilled have been a part of my life and my journey. Coming, coming off of that story, um, you've been president of the Hornets slash Bobcats uh, for, for almost 15 years now. When you reflect on the time that you've spent with the organization, what do you consider to be your most significant accomplishment or the one that you're most proud of? You know, I'd say that prob prob probably two, Josh. Um, one is being a part, being allowed to be one of the six business people that um, were handpicked to, to go to Raleigh and, uh, and really work with, with Governor Cooper, Speaker Moore, Senator Berger, Senator Blue, and uh, my House Minority Leader, Darren Jackson, to work very hard to have House Bill 2 repealed by a bipartisan vote. And that meant a lot of time in Raleigh, a lot of knocking on doors on both sides of the aisle, asking people to support what we felt was right. That's certainly one, and that, that will hopefully be a part of my legacy in playing a small part in. The second I'd say was, you know, our rebranding from the Bobcats, which for whatever reason, no one in the world wanted to support that brand. Uh, I got here in 2006 and uh, we were the Bobcats. The Charlotte community didn't like us. No one wanted to be our fans. No one wanted to wear our apparel. No one was proud of us, but we were here grinding every day, as you know, Josh, trying to get people to do that. You know, when the New Orleans uh, Hornets decided to relinquish their name, and uh, when Mr. Benson, who also owns the New Orleans Saints, one of the names that resonated more with New Orleans and picked the Pelicans as a state bird and the bird that protects the coastline in New Orleans, when the Hornets name became available again, and our fans were dying for us to go back and reclaim the beloved Hornets name that uh, the team led the NBA in attendance for nine straight years as an expansion team. The team sold out every game for those nine years. They won 50 games on the court and became, you know, a powerhouse in the East. Uh, you know, just, I could go on and on. They did so many great things in the community. The purple and teal became iconic sports colors, uniform colors. Alexander Julian had created a really cool uniform with pinstripes. When we had the opportunity to go back and reclaim that name, you know, it was something that uh, we had to make a business case to Michael that it made sense for us to spend $5 million to rebrand, go back to the Hornets name, go to the New Orleans Pelicans and see if they'd allow us to take the history of 1988 when the Hornets first came to Charlotte to 2002 when the Hornets moved to New Orleans, have that history be married to our Charlotte Bobcats history from 2004 until 2015, you know, and have that become the Charlotte Bobcats Hornets family with all the history. That really changed the direction and, and, and how people felt about us as a team and as an organization. Overnight, you know, fans started flocking. We immediately went to 10,000 season ticket holders. We immediately signed big sponsors. We got Linden Tree to put their name on a patch on our jerseys. I can just go on and on and on. We became well-respected. The NBA allowed us to go play in China and represent the NBA in Charlotte in the global games. Uh, it just it continued to grow and blossom. And it was a complete team effort by literally 
everyone in this organization and Michael making a $5 million commitment to that rebranding. And now, as you can see, the iconic colors we have, the way we've extended with the history of the, the first gold rush in the North Carolina with our mint uniforms, it continues to grow. And, and I think, Josh, you may have mentioned it, uh, when Michael bought our team in 2010, and this is very public, uh, it was in the range of $175 million. And just uh, two years ago, our, our organization was valued at $1.5 billion, right at roughly seven times uh, what he paid for the organization. And so uh, our asset value has continued to grow. Our fan base has continued to grow. Our young team is improving on the court once we can get everybody healthy. And it's fun to be here every day, Josh, as you know, when uh, back in 2007, 8, 9, 10, it wasn't a lot of fun to be a Charlotte Bobcat employee, but we had to grind our way through. So I'd say those two are probably the two that, uh, that I'm most proud of that, that we were able to, to do. And again, it wasn't me. There were a lot of us that worked together as teammates to accomplish these things. For Dr. Regan's sake, I'm glad that we got into asset value and, and got to touch on some, some economics. And, and you know what, Josh, you know, one thing that, that I, 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 I remit, I'm remiss that I didn't say at the very beginning was getting to know Dr. Regan, you know, and him being a national expert and in, in, in nationally recognized uh, in the area of economic impact. Uh, I first met him with the city of Charlotte, hired him to be their subject matter expert uh, as they were valuing how important our arena was and what economic impact our arena had had over the first 10 years of his existence. And, uh, and Dr. Regan put together a very, very thorough um, presentation for the city of Charlotte to present to city council and the mayor on the billion dollar impact that the, at the time, Time Warner Cable Arena, now Spectrum Center had had on the Charlotte region. And so, you know, let, let's not forget how important um, the, the, the academic world is, how important the University of South Carolina is, how important Dr. Regan uh, has been, and how well respected he is in, uh, in that area of economics. Touching on, on academics and students, what advice would you give to the students joining us today as they begin to embark on their careers? Well, the, the, the first bit of advice I give them is, well, several pieces. One, there's nothing more valuable than an internship. Uh, you know, unfortunately, I was not aware that internships were happening when I was uh, uh, going through undergrad and even grad school. But the, the real entree, entree to, to professional sports these days is being able to navigate your way and applying for an internship with a professional franchise or sports agent or whatever field you like to go in. You know, we at the Hornets have a, a you know, a, a, a very, very, um, broad internship program that goes across literally every facet of our business uh, and whatever your major is, it's likely that we have an internship in that role because we run a business just like every other company. We have all the departments every other company has, a legal department, finance department, marketing, sales. We've got basketball operations. We've got community relations, uh, communications where Josh works. There are internship opportunities in all of those. And it's a good way for students to see, hey, do I really want to work in sports? Is this what I want to do every day in my career? And it gives us a free peek to see if you're a bright, young, up and coming potential employee or teammate that we want to recruit to be a part of our organization after you finish undergrad or grad school or even law school. And then the other thing I'd say is, and there's a book that I always encourage students to read. It's called The Power of Who. W-H-O, The Power of Who, and it's by Bob Bodine, B-E-A-U-D-I-N-E, and I get no proceeds from this, so it's, uh, it's just a book I truly believe in, because as I look back on my career, the people that helped me most in having opportunities for great roles, and anybody that tells you they got any job or role because they were the smartest person, or had the best resume, or they did it all on their own, they are gravely mistaken. Everybody needs somebody to help them open that door. And through my career, it happened to be people that I knew either at church or in my community or a friend that I knew or a friend of a friend that I knew. And that's exactly what Bob Bodine's book talks about. 
making sure instead of thinking you go network at a conference and pass out a bunch of business cards to strangers who may want to help you, how about leaning on the people closest to you, your family, your friends, your friends of your family that genuinely have a vested interest in seeing you happy and successful. Those are the people that, and more often than not, have the ability to make one or two phone calls, help open that door for you, and really genuinely want to see you be successful. So um, that's uh, my other word of advice. Think about what you want to do as a career, what wouldn't feel like work every day. I know, Josh, when we come in to Spectrum Center every day, it doesn't feel like work. We love being here. Figure out what that is, and then figure out a path to get there and who can help you get there, and don't be afraid to ask for that help. So we're, we're just about out of time, and I don't know if I'm allowed to go over a little bit, but I know you well enough to know that there's one topic that's, that's near and dear to your heart that we haven't touched on yet. And I think it's an important part of who you are. And, and as I'm introducing you to everybody who's watching today, I, I wanna make sure that we get to this. For more than 35 years, you have run the Achievements Unlimited Basketball School each summer, with the unfortunate exception of this past one, obviously. Uh, and for half of that time, your Hoopty Classic Golf Tournament and Hoopty Charities have helped thousands of kids go to summer camps that they might not have otherwise been able to do so. What led you to start AU and what keeps you going with that? Wow, that's, that's a great question, Josh. Well, you're right. Of all the things that I've been fortunate enough to do in my life, nothing makes me more proud than the 35 years that um, my staff and, and, and corporate community have supported us providing opportunities for more than 10,000 underprivileged kids to attend our Achievements Unlimited Basketball School over the last 35 years. The reason I started Achievements Unlimited is I grew up in Greensboro, lower middle class. My mom was a school teacher. My dad worked in the postal system. The young kids I played with and against as kids grew up in Morningside Homes, which was a housing project. We met at Windsor Community Center, which was right in the middle. They walked from one direction, I'd walk to the other. We also played Little League Baseball in Noco Park, which was right across the street from Windsor Community Center in Greensboro. By the time I was 25 years old, half of those young kids were dead because of some drug-related activity. And by the way, they all were probably better athletes than I was. They just didn't have anyone in their corner to help give them something to dream about, push them, tell them how important education was like I did. So when I started Achievements Unlimited Basketball School, basketball was just a hook. And I was lucky that Michael Jordan and Ralph Sampson, Johnny Dawkins and David Henderson, two players from Duke, agreed to help me start my basketball school for underserved kids and have basketball be the hook to get them there and preach education, how important education is and how important it is to stay drug free. 35 years later, we've had 10,000 kids come through our program. Many of them have gone on to be military officers, doctors, lawyers, teachers, police officers, you name it, college professors. I'm so proud of all these kids that, you know, didn't really think they had a lot of hope in life that have done extremely well in their lives. And uh, our Hoop Tea Charities has allowed us over the past 17 years through our golf tournament and our Hoop Tea Hardwood Legends Dinner in New York to not only provide scholarships for kids to go to basketball camps, but for other educational activities that will allow these kids from very depressed, underserved neighborhoods to be able to enjoy things in their lives that we sort of take for granted when we've got two great parents at home that can provide for us. And so that's the impetus of, um, of my life. And, and I hope that'll be the legacy that I'm remembered by a lot more than being the president of the Hornets or you know, working at Nike or working for the Wizards. For me, deep in my heart, it's all about the kids at Achievements Unlimited Basketball School and the kids we're able to touch through Hoop Tea Charities. I think that's a great place to leave off. I want to thank everybody uh, that's here today. I know there were some questions in the Q&A that we didn't quite get to. Um, sorry about that. It means that. we got to come back, Josh. Exactly. That means Dr. Dr. Regan's got to invite us back or <laughs> Professor Morrison or uh, <laughs> Professor Gerald's um, or, or even Don Staley, Coach Staley. <laughs> We're happy to go down and see the Gamecocks at any point. Now you don't have to tell me. Well, I want to, uh, as we conclude here, I want to 
thank Josh very much for moderating. But you know, you have the gold rush sitting back there in the background in the history of North Carolina, but the really gold came from your knowledge today and sharing it with us. And I really appreciate you taking the time and sharing it with everybody who attended here today. I think we got up to close to 180. So I, I was hoping for 250, but I'm always uh, optimistic. <laughs> I can't thank you enough for everything. You're always welcome anytime. And um, of all the lecture series we've had, this is gonna be right up there with them. And uh, your legacy, is obviously shown and easily shown by what you have done and shared with us today. And I can't thank you enough. And uh, Josh, you stay in touch. And Mr. Whitfield, thank you very, very much. And everybody who thank attended. Th thanks so much, Dr. Regan. It's been an honor to be here. Thank Absolutely. you. Thank you. All right. Have a good evening. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.